the idea that, the, that, that life was a gift that was lived in the moment. Not in the plans, not in people's expectations, not in rules, not in dogma, not in any of the so-called boxes and limitations that we place ourselves in, but rather in a milieu, in, in a catalytic process of endless becoming. And as such, I thought at any minute that a crazy kid like me hanging upside down from branches and trees was not going to live for very long. And therefore, if I wasn't going to make it to six, if I wasn't going to make it to six years old, I had better make the best out of every single moment that I've got. And that required me to hang upside down from trees. Why? Partly because it felt good. No apologies. Also because it inverted my perception. Good God, a six-year-old can get stuck in his ways. <laughs> Everything looked, you know, they're right all the damn time. Just listen to my son Wolfson. Constantly correct him, you're not right, Papa. <laughs> and so <laughs> that, that kind of certainty is, is dashed again and again and again as we embrace and walk through life. And so for me, death was my partner. It was my buddy. It was, my, it was the moment that I was going to be re-entered -in into this flesh, this sensual, almost erotic being that is Mother Earth. Sure, she's the, you know, stodgy, you know, usually heavy set, uh, amorphous, unclear <laughs> genetic background, but she's also this erotic thing that's constantly lovemaking to herself through her constituent parts in ways that creates life endlessly and renews. Same with healing, that's the Mother Earth once again, having this erotic arousal that brings, flushes the skin, flushes the body, flushes the organs with what? Vitality. The same vitality that, that we're being robbed by boring jobs with no purpose and no meaning. Robbed by being party to politics that doesn't represent us, that's always lying to us. Robbed even if we go so far into science that we lose wonder. And you'll notice that we have some majorly nerdy people here <laughs> who nonetheless do not leave that state of wonder that brings about not only new information, but new revelation and excitation. And that's what we're living for. We're living for life. So trace it back to a place that you all probably remember, at least in one way or another, in some personalized way, unique way, that you were brought into plants through some sense of being called, some sense of being amazed. Your curiosity is just overwhelming. You feel an attachment. You feel like they're trying to tell you something. You feel less yourself if you don't handle plants and get outside once in a while. That's what brings you to it. And every step we take, every choice we make is, a, is another point of overlap of these patternings. It's where things, out, not outside of ourselves, but different from what we imagine to be ourselves, intercede almost and do interventions in our myopia and bring us back to the realization that we're a part of something larger, something more beautiful than anyone can ever imagine. So this is why history is so important, because it's a story. A story of caring, of healing, of learning, of blossoming, rooting, blossoming, and having a hell of an impact on the world in the most wondrous ways possible. That's what herbalism is. That's why you are here. That's who you are. It doesn't exist without you. It doesn't exist without your stories. There will be no history. And so as we thread our way through all these different challenges about you know, licensure and regulation and and commercialization and all this stuff, we have to remember, not just remember, we have to be the memory keepers, the wisdom keepers, the wildness keepers that keep herbalism from becoming too tame, too rote, too unchallenging, too unexplorative, too fearful, too legal to be any fun anymore. <laughs> This is important, and it's important because the moment that we're sharing is a liminal moment. Liminality is kind of like where it is now outside. Liminality is not this and not that. Liminality is that moment between day and night, 
Um, liminality is certain times in the year. Um, liminality is not being firmly in the middle of something, rather being on the edge of something. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that liminality is both scary and powerful. It turns out that being in certain places in the world, certain sites have an essential, for lack of a better word, empowerment to them. They make you feel different when you're there. And the ancients do this. The ancients knew this, and it was part of an oral tradition. In Ireland, for example, uh, there is the Dinchenicus, which is uh, lore of places. Basically, it's a set of stories, a set of prose poems, all of which deal with the sacred geography of the island of Ireland. It is basically mythologically, here's why this site's important. Hey, those are the Paps of Anu. You look at them, you're like, whoa, they do look like two breasts rising out of the horizon. Um, there was meaning in that, right? You never forget it once you see it. It's embedded in your mind. And that's how traditionally people named things. And naming things is important because language is important. The Navajo have a philosophy, which is a part of their cosmology, <clears throat> which is thought precedes language, language precedes reality. Basically, you are speaking reality into existence. It's not a new idea, right? The New Age movement has moved that into like, you know, ask for a card and you get one, despite children dying in Sudan from starvation. So, you know, there's no, there's no equity um, in that kind of an idea. However, the Navajo don't take it that way. They take it as a more sacred act of creating reality, which means if you talk too much, you're making a really chaotic reality. Why? Because you're wasting a lot of your effort and a lot of your time. It's important, though, to know that, especially like these oral traditions, and Navajo is a long oral tradition, right? Uh, before people became literate, the information that was passed down was passed down from generation to generation orally. And we are the living vestiges of an ancient oral tradition. You know who's not a plant healer? You know who's not an herbalist? The people who tell you how things are. The people who say, that's not right. Oh, okay. Because there are no right answers, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to healing. This is the failing of residencies in hospitals. Mm -hmm. It's far removed from maybe a lot of your experience, but it's a shaming process. If you don't give that one right answer when whoever that overseeing um, doctor is um, to that question, um, then you are shamed. Oh, you idiot. You clearly don't belong here. How in the world did you get this far? Because the assumption is, well, this person's clearly got congestive heart failure, so you need to prescribe Lasix. Hello? <laughs> oh, I don't know that I would choose that. It's not the right answer. It might be the right answer for Mary. It might even be the right answer for Jim, but it may not be the right answer for Larry or Mo or Curly because there aren't right answers when it comes to healing. And so this place that we are sitting on is a sacred place. It's a liminal place. Historically, liminal places are where earth, sea, and sky meet or land, water, and air. There are places that are removed from the norm. They're outside of the normal reality. You have to make an extra effort to get to those places. And they harness an inherently greater amount of power. The Dinchenicus from, uh, from Ireland go back as far as the sixth century uh, with a poet named Amergen, who was the court poet for a king, King Diarmid, and there are over 200 place names. Um, and you know, over here is where the dog did drug his club. Here's where Dion Kext and his wonderful healing children dunked the warriors from the Catholic toilet um, into the well so that they get resurrected and came back tomorrow and fought again, unless they had too bad of a head, head wound. Those places are named and you can go there. And when you do, you get the opportunity to experience something a little out of the norm, right? 
not just because they've been set aside by being called sacred places, but because they actually have encompassed a different feeling. Mm. And at some fundamental level, that's kind of where we're at, right? It is, what do you think? How do you think this is going to go? How do you feel about this? You know, this concept of good belly? You know, good belly? The story is, uh, this story comes from uh, Dr. Carl Hammerschlag. Dr. Carl Hammerschlag was my psychiatry professor in medical school. Uh, he wrote um, uh, The Dancing Healers um, and uh, several other books. Um, Carl's, uh, Carl went to South America to train with a shaman. And he's kind of a heavier set psychiatrist. You can picture him, you know, got a boon to me by his big voice. Super nice guy. He's a psychiatrist. I mean, yeah, there are some places where you can kind of keep on an asshole demeanor in the world of psychiatry. He's trying to do it differently. He goes to the South American shaman. He's going to learn something. The shaman looks at him and he says, you can't be a healer. He says, why? He says, you don't have good belly. He says, well, I've got some indigestion. I definitely take some stuff for that. He says, you won't be able to heal. <laughs> he says, well, I have a practice. I mean, I see patients. Yeah, it's unfortunate for them. <laughs> <laughs> and here is this distinguished professor, you know, psychiatrist, you know. He works for the government, you know, and so uh, and he's like, well, of course I can heal. I can't heal. <laughs> like, well, what do I do about my belly? Because you've got to get good belly. He says, well, what does that mean? He says, well, if you have a full belly when you go see your patient, how do you feel? It gets grumbly and uncomfortable. He says, so you're paying attention to your belly. You're not, paying, you're not present for the patient. What if you don't eat? It grumbles and it rolls and I have this acid situation. So you're thinking about your belly? Yeah, I guess I am. The guy says, no matter what you're doing, you're thinking about that belly. He says, you're kind of right. Says, how do you do any healing? Carl had to come home and figure out how to fix his belt. And now we talk about good belt. Like, hey, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm not finding my good belly today. All right, well, maybe, maybe you should go home for a while. Maybe you should go do something else. It's important because we have to be present. All right. So today, so when I go to a place, I'm a nature worshiper. I freely admit it. Uh, the other things I worship too. Um, and, uh, Nature's kind of a big thing. And when I come to a place, I want to just immerse myself in the place. <laughs> you know, to the degree that you can, can you really grok this place? Just smile when you do it. Smile. Because we have the opportunity to deeply connect with places. And so today we had to do something, my wife and I. We had to get underground. Because this is high up. This is way up, Continental Divide. We're at Pikes Peak. This is great. It's great. It's a little vata. And it's great. <laughs> we got as deep underground as we could. We spent a couple of hours in the deepest cave that we could get to in this area. And there's a lot of them. And uh, in that pitch blackness that you get nowhere else in the cave, insight comes. I needed that because this place is important and it's special because there's a liminality to it that allows us to concentrate a certain amount of human talent, potential, right here. And then we get to interact with one another in a different way than I get to interact with anybody else in my world. Because you guys are part of a larger family, my family, Wolf's family, your family. We are in a margin together. We're all really different. 
but we share this margin. And the margin is a liminal place, and the margin is a powerful place. We talk about authenticity and the importance of authenticity in life, right? Your real power as an individual is in who you are authentically as you. Fair? Mm -hmm. If you're playing someone else, you're probably not even having a good bell. <laughs> so, as we congregate together in these kinds of liminal places and we're sharing information, we're sharing part of an oral tradition. And this is an oral tradition that some parts have gone as far back as, you know, people sitting around a fire pit. I love me some rock art. And uh, I really like Barrier Canyon petroglyphs. Do you know about Barrier Canyon petroglyphs? They're the archaic. They're six to 10,000 years old petroglyphs. There's some by our house, well, between Sedona and Cottonwood, that are the most southern occurring of the Barrier Canyon petroglyphs. They're named Barrier Canyon because the main petroglyph panel is in Utah, in Canyon Lands, and it's amazing. And then there is mo there's the same style that's spread all the way up as north as Chimney Rock outside of Durango, and as far south as this site between Sedona and Cottonwood. It's called Palatki. At Palatki is a 12th is a grotto. A grotto is a cave with a pool of water in it that has a seating arrangement on the outside of it. And this grotto has been in continuous use for 12,000 years. Yeah. Go sit in there. Feel some stuff. You got to get underground. You got to get on top of ground. And you got to get in some water. If you're going to connect with a place, it's water, it's depth, it's height, right? <laughs> I kind of look at it as there's three realms to this world. There's an underworld, there's a middle world, there's an upper world. Um, we're kind of denizens of the middle world. You know, here we are doing our thing. But we don't fit. We don't fit in this culture that we find ourselves in. We don't fit in this culture because this culture has some distorted sense of what we refer to as sociocultural legitimacy. <laughs> and we've got to talk a little bit about that because it's a little bit of an elephant in a room for a lot of us that are here. Because sometimes that issue of sociocultural legitimacy pairs too easily with imposter syndrome. And these are two things that a lot of us in the margins have to struggle with because we don't have the credentials that make us embraced by the world at large. Thank the gods! Because <laughs> that really just screws up people's personalities, if you ask me. They just get weird. <laughs> and not in a good way. This is weird in a good way. I love you guys <laughs> because of that. Because we get to come together in this liminal place, in this liminal time, and explode with our ideas, with one another, knowing that we have a group of people who are not gonna judge us for being wacko. They're gonna be like, hey, oh, you know what, too? If I put a little of this in there, I'm gonna work even better. And that's the magic of communion, and it's the magic of community. Sociocultural legitimacy is sort of this tribal way the humans create cliques and you're okay and you're not okay and you can be a friend of mine and you can't be a friend of mine and that kind of crap. Sociocultural legitimacy is how we determine that, well, you're allowed to do this in this culture and you're not allowed to do this in this culture. You're an herbalist. Oh, you better not diagnose anybody. <laughs> oh, okay. Because that's the magic thing that doctors do. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if you say to your local geo, uh, uh, urologist, um, I 
I got me some damp heat in the lower burner. <laughs> You're going to be like, oh, well, uh, good luck with that. Right? <laughs> The language becomes important because we've moved from an oral tradition and we think, we think, let me say that differently, we thought that oral traditions maybe lasted 150, 200 years. We thought that people don't remember these things. So recently a book that came out, it's really pretty fascinating. I don't agree with everything he says, but it's called The Archaeology of Memory. And this particular fellow, I don't even remember his name, but it's a pretty decent book. <laughs> uh, he goes back through the oral traditions. He's mostly involved in Australia and Oceania. That's kind of his thing, because what he's looking at is, we've looked a lot at climate change. And what he's saying is, you know, the oceans have changed a lot over the last 10,000 years. Did people record that in their oral traditions? Yeah. Uh, it turns out that indeed they did. As part of the um, Australian dream time that everybody's responsible to remember with each generation, which is orally passed on, they talk about 10,000 years ago. They don't talk about the time frame, but they talk about the Great Barrier Reef um, being exposed, being covered, being exposed, being covered. And the dates that they have are pretty accurate based upon what we know from the fossil record. More close to home, 7,600 years ago in uh, southern Oregon, a crater blew up and made Crater Lake. We know it was 7,600 years ago, and when you trace back the oral traditions of the people who lived there, they have that as part of their oral tradition. Mm -hmm. The Dinchenicus was basically stories about places. And why do you need stories about places? Because in generation after generation, if you're trying to express an idea and you're saying, so if you go down to the corner, um, a half an mile down the road, turn left at the left, at the red mailbox, take another right, go down about two miles, you're losing people. A few years ago, my daughter had a friend over. Friend's name is Kiana. My daughter and Kiana are out in the desert riding motorcycles. And Kiana comes up out of a wash and smacks into a tree. The tree branch ugh, slices her right here, right over her liver. And um, so they call me, I go running out there and she's crying. They're like 14. And she's like, oh, and um, Kiana has darker pigment. And so as it opened, uh, the fat underneath her skin came out. And so there was just a really big contrast between the dark of her skin, the light of her fat and the blood. And so she's like, oh my God. I'm like, <laughs> You're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. You know, I'm like, let's get her home. Make sure she's not bleeding from her liver because maybe that happened. Um, she was not um, with the ultrasound. And then, uh, and then what are you going to do? I mean, she needs probably three stitches, honestly. Um, and uh, I'm like, well, she's not my kid. It's my kid. We put the stitches in. Um, she's not. So I got to call her parents. Tell them what happened. They're fighting. It's awkward because now I got to meet them at the hospital. They're fighting with each other. So they're mad and angry. And I'm like, well, I know, but your daughter. And like, so now that tree for our family is the tree that Kiana stabbed herself on. And it will always be that. Now, if you get lost in the desert, we say, hey, I'll meet you at the tree that Kiana got stabbed on. <laughs> now we all know what we're talking about. Right? Because we shared an experience and we shared an understanding. That's why they're the Paps of Anu. When you see them, you're like, oh, I see what you're talking about. Right? And you'll never forget it. If we call it Bison Peak and it looks like a bison, then you could remember that. If we just call it things because of it, McAllister Peak. I don't mean anything to anybody, except for your, if your name is McAllister, maybe. Right? Oral traditions had built in mnemonics. And part of those mnemonics were a collective understanding of what's going on uh, because of a shared experience. Now, you may not be able to share that experience. It may come to some day where my great grandchildren are out riding motorcycles in the air. And they're like, yeah, well, we'll meet you by Kiana's tree. 
you know, because it'll get shortened. Um, and, you know, Kiana may never visit that tree again. <laughs> it's still her tree because a thing happened there. This is the trench that the dog dug, grew, drug, dug when he drug his club through here. Okay, then that's what that is. Now, it doesn't mean that that's really what happened there. Or does it? It's liminal. We don't know. It's from the sands of time. So, when we come around to this idea of what creates a certain kind of sociocultural legitimacy, we have to contrast that with authenticity. So, your best healing is going to happen when you're authentically you. But authentically you, when you were three, might have been a bipolar asshole. <laughs> Sometimes that's what three's about. <laughs> So you got to figure out how you're going to navigate your world, right? You don't want to, you, you want a cookie, mom will give you a cookie, you throw a tantrum, maybe you get the cookie, maybe you don't. You're trying things out, you're trying to figure it out, right? As time goes by, we make concessions in our authenticity. Here's what I would like to do, but we think we want to be a good person, so I'm not going to do that, I might do this instead. As time goes by in our lives, it's a constant arrangement of becoming who we think we should be to please the people around us or to create attachment, to make it so that people want to have a relationship with us, people respect us, maybe they even want to come to us as a client. So now how do we change ourselves in those ways? Because that, that's where it gets really sticky. Because that's where we lose ourselves and that's where our bellies don't get so good anymore. Because now we're being somebody different than we were, right? However, sociocultural legitimacy looks like this. And I use religion to start with because part of this process was really introduced by Houston Smith in his great book, World Religions, where he talks about evolution of religious processes. And I'm like, oh, this is just like the, the evolution of medical processes which is just another religion that just doesn't make it into the book. And so the idea is if you are a staunch Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Muslim, Jewish person, whatever you are, and you are a upstanding member of your community and you're going to church or the synagogue or wherever you're going three times a week, you are doing this socioculturally legitimate thing for being that person. Now, does that make you a good person? Does that make you a powerful healer? <laughs> no. Uh, it just means you're part of a community. And maybe you're a really good person in that community. That's fine. Who did you have to become to become a part of that community? Just had to make some concessions as to who you were so that they would accept you. Because they won't accept all of us, right? They don't really care for me, most of those folks. I say the wrong things sometimes. I don't look the way that I should if I'm going to go there. And I'm always a little nervous because I think I'm going to hit by a bolt of lightning when I walk in. I don't really think that because I think Thor's really in charge of the lightning. But that's just me. <laughs> We trade too much for social cultural legitimacy. And here's what happens. We disempower ourselves. You see, we're in a crisis in this culture at large. We're in a crisis. Enrollment in higher institutions of learning down 30%. We can't get funding for residency programs. there is a larger and larger gap occurring between the haves and the have-nots within our world. And so as that cultural crisis happens, you have a larger and larger number of people who are disenfranchised from the overculture. A lot of them are poverty-stricken. A lot of them just have different ideas that just don't mesh with what the overculture is. And here we are in a world now, in a time within at least our nation, where there's a lot of judgment. There's a lot of bigotry. And there's a lot of 
presumption that goes on about the way that people are and the who that people are. And there's a lot of rules about who can do what. You can diagnose all day long. Please. You can treat people all day long, and you should. Because the public needs you. They're not being served by the modern medical establishment. Before we left from Phoenix, there was a um, article, a journal article that came out uh, that I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have any time to incorporate this, but I'm going to try to anyway, which the article was uh, the dangers of prescribing medications. I was like, oh, all right, let's, I'll, I'll buy it. So I'm reading the article, and the article says, physicians today have overconfidence in the efficacy of their medications. And as a result, people are dying. I was like, well, I kind of knew that. <laughs> but it's nice that someone else is noticing it too. <laughs> According to a study, so, all right, I'll back this up a little bit. In the state of Arizona, uh, I'm going to back that up even a little bit more. The FDA has deputized the state boards of pharmacy to help enforce some of the FDA rules because the uh, courts are not upholding the FDA's rulings against uh, certain manufacturers. So they found themselves in a kind of ineffective position because the judges who some of them apparently are some free thinking people are thinking that the FDA is not exactly right in some of their rulings. That's a novel thing. It's a good thing. It's an important thing. Um, but what it means is that they are allowing the state boards of pharmacy now to be the arbiters of the law. And they did it under the presumption that we have an opiate crisis. Physicians are over-prescribing opiates. So always the hierarchy within medicine has been, here's the physician, and then you have the pharmacist. Because the pharmacists can't see patients. They can make some stuff, but they can't see anybody, right? Now it's reversed. Now the first order of business in every pharmacy board meeting is the punishment for the physicians who they don't think are prescribing things appropriately. You should go wherever your jurisdiction is. Because it's tragic. It's ridiculous. The second part of the pharmacy board meetings um, are what are called in Arizona, the PAPAS program, which is pharmacist addiction something something program. And so, uh, so then they come and they march out all of the pharmacists. Each one of them has to come up to the podium and describe how they're dealing with their addiction. I'm like, huh? Like the pharmacy board meetings are becoming like an AA meeting. That's good, right? But wow. Uh, and so as a result, the way that people choose how to practice medicine is changing. And it's not getting better. There's a greater and greater number of people who are not being taken care of by this medical system. And they have conditions um, that are not the norm. So the state of Arizona says, well, how efficacious... Um, oh, no, no. They asked the first question. The, the, the issue was... Um, close to 50% of the prescriptions that are being written aren't being picked up. The pharmacy board considers this a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Number one and two prescriptions in the United States and Canada. We talked about this yesterday. Analgesics and Crestor, statins, cholesterol-lowering drugs. Uh, people aren't picking up their statins when their insurance doesn't pay for it because it doesn't make them feel good. But you can bet they're not they're getting their analgesics, whatever that might be. How, right? I see a little boy who's 13 now um, who got Guillain-Barre syndrome from a flu shot. And now he's got intelligent at the toy posture. He's, um, we're getting him back to walking. You know, he has a hard time because every time we get him stretched and he gets to be able to stretch his limbs, he has a dang ghost spurt and he comes back in like this. 
then we do a lot of things and then they put him in the backseat of a Mazda and drive him back to Utah. And so <laughs> you do what you can do with the people that you have in front of you, right? You know why? Because you're a healer. That's why you do that. But you're more than a healer. Because we are the liminal members of our communities. Liminality doesn't have to exist just in calendars and in times and in spaces. Liminality is in people. We aren't this and we're not that. On the reservation, they say, neither dog nor wolf. That's a liminal place. It's a disempowered individual, unfortunately, on the reservation, who then in turn has to find their own power. Whatever that means. What does social power mean? That when you say something, people listen to you. That's all it means, right? You got some kind of credibility. Well, are you going to be credible with the people down at Walgreens? You would be surprised, because you would be. Because as soon as you started talking your language, they, they would be like, oh, tell me more. Because the truth is, is that we've lived under this umbrella of thinking we know a lot about human beings and bodies and medicine, only to come to find out that this far into the process, we're just about right on it 40% of the time. It means there's a lot of underserved people in this world. And the thing about that is, though those are people who've already felt like the medical system has failed them. And there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. They're really convinced that medicine doesn't have anything else to offer them. And in most of the cases, at least in my patient base, they've been told there's nothing more that they can offer them. You know what we say? Finally, you're released from that chain. Now, let's get to the work of healing some stuff. Starts with, how well do you feel supported in your world? Well, we're allies, you and me, we're going to do this thing. All right, we're going to have at least that much support. And then from there, how are we going to arrange this? Well, we do things differently, don't we? Right? What's called scientific medicine is somebody sitting with you in a room for five minutes and giving you the most popular prescribed drug in the country. That's scientific medicine. That is what I'm being told is evidence-based medicine, right? And that's the gold standard is evidence-based. You don't practice evidence-based medicine. I was told this by a cardiologist not long ago. <laughs> I said, how long did you spend with that patient? I don't know, the usual. Maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I asked the patient, she says six minutes. I timed it. I said, so do you know? And I started naming off some things. No, I didn't. I, well, I, I, I said, so these are the things that I discovered when I talked to the patient for an hour. We talked about what she has for breakfast. Why a bear claw is not really protein. <laughs> People believe what they want to believe. <laughs> you know, we went through how she's sleeping, how her relationships are. This is what we do with everybody, right? How are you moving? What are you eating? How are you thinking? What's going on in your world? You know what we call that? We call it collecting evidence. And then if you make a clinical de decision at the end of that process, you might be able to call that evidence-based. If you spend six minutes with somebody, how on earth could you possibly gather enough evidence to make a decent conclusion. And then for heaven's sake, you're going to prescribe the same damn thing that everyone else prescribes for anything peripherally related to this condition. That's what people are up against. Your insurance will pay for it. And sometimes that's enough. People are like, well, yeah, well, some of my pay insurance pays for it, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> Why? It boggles my mind. We had this conversation last night. What in the world do they think is going to happen out of that? Well, you know, if I don't take these medications, then my doctor's going to get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we wouldn't want that now, would we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But this is what people, especially of a certain generation, really believe about the people in the white coats, is that they're authority figures. They're knowledgeable people. They are advanced in our society. They're medical deities. Just ask them. They'll tell you. <laughs> you know what they're not? They're not culture shifters. You know why they're not culture shifters? Because they'd like it to stay exactly the same. Because the way that it is works for them. They got big houses and nice cars. They get to send their kids to the same medical school they went to, right? Remember legacy admissions? Oh, you can't do that. Oh, you think that's going to stop anything? Hello. <laughs> Because of our marginalized status, it creates us to be able to be in a liminal place. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful place. Because first of all, you're different than who they've ever seen before. Because of that difference, there's already a set of expectations that you can do something different than every other practitioner they ever saw. Maybe because you don't walk in with a white coat, maybe because you don't have the same haircut as the dermatologist, um, because you're just off enough from that norm that there's possibility here. Mm -hmm. It's important. One of my students years ago just had a really stressful time uh, after medical school. And um, first three years were just hard for her. She went back to New Jersey. It's an unlicensed jurisdiction for her. And she was just trying to really make it work. Um, and uh, it was stressful. And so all of her hair fell off. Alopecia areata. She flies back to Arizona. We talked quite a bit um, about it. And um, so at first, it's like, what can I do? What can I do to shave my hair? What can I do? I got to I got to get my hair back. I can I like, okay, 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 okay. The great thing is you're not going to die from it. So the other thing is you have choices, right? You can wear any number of wigs if you're into that. I said, or you can just sport it the way you are. I said, this is part of who you are. This is part of what you have to heal in your life. This is your healing journey. And you're just putting it out on your head. So that's probably not ideal for a lot of reasons. But you know what? <laughs> she started putting it out there. And she started treating people who had autoimmune diseases like alopecia areata. And you know what? Six months after she lost all of her hair, she was busier than she could ever possibly imagine she would ever be. As she stepped into her power, as she was able to embrace sort of the who that she was becoming, <coughs> she got to experience a different level of monetary gain. But also, more than that, she got to experience like real transformation in the people that she was seeing. Right? Because she was able to be present with them in a different way. My friends, your urologist, your dermatologist, your cardiologist is thinking about their golf game. They don't have good belly in a lot of cases. Do you know what the average age of death of physicians is in the, in the United States of America? 55. 54 years old. You were very close. Well, okay, oh, breathe. Oh, medical deity, save me. Save me, you're so wise. Oh, really? Oh, well, oh. I think that you probably need to get some therapy. Just being a generic doctor, I don't know. So, uh, <laughs> I, I do that because one of, one of my first kind of uh, uh, cynical moments for medicine was... Uh, my mother took me to a doctor when I was nine. We lived in Kingman, Arizona. Have you ever been to Kingman? Yeah. yeah. Woo! <laughs> so we're in Kingman, and the physician, he was a nice guy. He was from Iraq. I thought that was kind of cool. Like, what brings you to America? Uh, and, so, uh, and so here we are in his room, and it's a little tiny little office, and he's smoking a cigarette, and my mother's smoking a cigarette, and they're sharing an ashtray. And I'm, I'm nine, and I'm sitting between them. And he's got my x-ray up on the little light box. And he's pointing out, yeah, you've got, clearly you've got some allergy stuff going on. My guess is it's wood smoke because that's coming up this time of year. <laughs> I'm looking at the both of them as a nine-year-old going, really? Wood smoke? <laughs> I 
us. <laughs> because sometimes we can be oblivious. <laughs> um, uh, so, my message to you is this, is that you have the potential to change the culture. One person at a time. But here's the thing. People who've been given a death sentence and then they survive it, get big mouths. And they start telling a lot of other people. So the more that you're doing good work with individuals, then the more that they tell other individuals what good work you're doing. And then you have to decide, what kind of work do I want to do? Who do I want to spend my time with? And what kind of things do I want to engage my time with? Uh, here again, you're a plant healer. This is a different kind of an herbalist. This is not the herbalist who's walking around with their book in the back pocket going, Oh, you got sniffles? Okay, I'm going to put you on a little bit of ephedra. That's the stuff. <laughs> As if that was even available, right? Um, we had the very good fortune a couple of months ago, a month ago or so, just to hang with Mark Blumenthal. You guys know who Mark Blumenthal is? He's a director of ABC, the American Botanical Council. The guy's friggin' hilarious. Like, he will have you rolling on the floor laughing about the most ridiculous things. Um, and so he's just finished up a long-term study that the American Botanical Council has done um, on the um, herbs that are in health food stores and the herbs that are in um, uh, Walmart and the herbs that are in grocery stores. And what he found is that 70% of them are adulterated or out of date. He says, what people are going, he says, <clears throat> people go to their supermarket to get a bottle of echinacea. He says, and it might be 25 to 30% of the potency of any other echinacea that somebody got. I know. You know why? This is why we can't get funding for residencies. Medical schools are struggling. The nature medical schools are struggling and some of the herbal programs are struggling because the big corporations have noticed that the supplement industry um, was $146 billion last year and is projected to be $196 billion over the next five years. And so Nestle says, holy crap, we're going to buy Garden of Life. And they did. Clean athlete. And they did. And what was the third one that they bought? I forget Rainbow. now. Rainbow Light. Oh no, Rainbow Light was bought by Clorox. That's oh, my God. God. <laughs> uh, at this moment, pharmaceutical companies are crazily buying up all of these little herb, these supplement companies. Why? What would make that a good investment for them? They changed the standards. They changed the CGMP rules. They changed the manufacturing policies and the rules. And so now it's hard for you to start a herbal company as an individual, uh, accommodate the CGMP re requirements, um, FTC requirements with your labeling, all of that. They've made it a much higher hurdle for small companies to go into business, which is a part of the process. They also buy up all of the raw materials um, when they have a big project coming along. So it's harder to get certain things at certain times. Uh, and sometimes they might just do that on purpose, just because. If you consider that it doesn't really serve those pharmaceutical companies, there's a lot of them, and a lot of your favorite companies have been purchased already. Uh, so check into who owns your company if you're using stuff that you're buying from a store. Most of us, I make a lot of my own stuff and I have, I know personally the people that make the stuff that I don't make. And I keep an herbalist employed at my office full time and she makes the stuff that we talk about and, um, and that I don't have time for or we do it together. It's important because people think they can get on the internet and be an herbalist and go down to Walmart and buy some St. John's work and start taking it, and then they're gonna say what? These herbs don't work. <laughs> and so, here's where you come in. 
And like, oh yeah, we need to let people know. We need to let people know that Nestle has purchased Garden of Life and that the quality of the products have uh, <laughs> gone down tremendously as soon as they put them into Walmart. And that the crap that people are, have available to them is not even close to the quality of uh, Phoenix's freeze-dried cilantro. I mean, come on. <laughs> come on. That's innovation, right? That's brilliant. It's brilliant. Collect the sublimated water, use it back in your preparation to bring it up to a teacher. Well done, sir. Here's the thing. Is that's what we do. <laughs> that's what we do, right? And you know how you create social, sociocultural legitimacy? There's actually a format for it. Innovation, which then receives local acceptance, which then gets diffused and then receives general acceptance. Whoa! Steps one and two are awesome. Stop there. Because we don't make a one-size-fits-all medicine. You know why we don't make one-size-fits-all medicines? Because they don't work. That's why the pharmaceuticals are only 40% effective. Because people are too much of an individual. You're too different than the next person. So that drug may or may not have the same effect in you. The same herb may not have the same effect in you. What makes a healer? Healing, having to do it yourself, eating your herbs, collecting your herbs, spending time in your garden, in your forest, collecting the herbs, sitting with them, being with them, creating a relationship with the land that you're associated with, the plants that are in that land, creating that association gives you some insight, some intuition. And as time goes by, as you're able to tap into that intuitive place, your healing qualities go way up. Because now it's not just authentically you, but it's deeply authentically you. Because it came from some wellspring deep inside you that's been there all along, it just needed to have the right alignment for that to be able to come up. Got to start with good belly. Got to start with the right attitude. I am large with who I've seen here. You guys have that. I do herbal conferences all over the country. Not everybody has that. You know, the American Herbals Guild would love to get a little taste of this, right? <laughs> because they're really supportive of standardized herbal medicine. Standardized herbal medicine. We're chasing a dragon. Biomedical model says you need to know the constituents and how they work within the receptors. <laughs> Whatever. All right. Some of that's pretty darn interesting. <laughs> but better healers than you don't know that. Right? They might be living in the Amazonian jungle. And they're doing just fine. By the way, this is the big thing. Here's the elephant in the room for modern medicine. 12 years ago, 13 years ago, there was a big cardiology strike in California. Uh, they were out for a month. That month still is the lowest death rate that they've had in that state. Oh. <laughs> Oh, holy crap, guys, we got to get back to work before someone figures something out. <laughs> weird. Yeah, weird. It's so weird. It's so weird. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> we are needed. Our communities need us. The people in our communities, they want the information that we can provide for them. They're hungry for it. They're eager for it. How do we get that message to them? Right? Because you can stand on the street corner. In my world, um, I went to every health food store. We did talks. We did a thing at the health food store where we said, the doctor is in. Hey, I'm going to be here on Wednesday from 1 to 4. And uh, 
if you have questions or you want to talk about products or whatever, come on over. We'll talk about stuff. Um, and uh, usually it was just fun. Um, now I have a guy who plays guitar in my office on Wednesday, so now I don't go anywhere. <laughs> but, uh, but you put yourself out there. You know, you go to the places, you talk to the people in your community, you talk to the dermatologists, and you say, hey, you know what? Um, uh, I got this skin preparation that um, is really great. You want to try it? And give them a sample of something that you made, if that's what your thing is, you know? Or go to the whoever, the rheumatologist. Hey, you know what? This is a really great thing for people's pain, or whatever. But talk to them. Let them know that you're not just some wacky person who's living on the fringes of society, even though you might be. And that's okay. And that's where your healing power might come from. And that's okay. And we want that. But at the same time, it's a matter of networking and making it so that your presence is known. The problem is, is that we are an oppressed part of the culture, pushed out and marginalized and put into a category of, well, you're not really a doctor. Okay. So? Now what? I don't have that big of student loans, you get to say, um, <laughs> you know? Plus a lot more people coming in the future are gonna be able to say that, we'll say this, have the same situation because enrollment's really far down. Um, and we're about to have a mass number of physicians retire. Uh, in fact, um, an article I read last week says that um, we're gonna have a uh, really big problem in pediatric ophthalmology specifically in the next couple of years because there's not enough practitioners already and a lot of those are going to retire. You know who does eye stuff really, really, really well? Plant healers. How many of you do eye things? Eye drops, eye washes. Okay. Well, let's talk about a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Every, just about, with, it, with good, re with, put sense in this, but most things that you can make into a tea, if you can make a quart of that tea and you can put two teaspoons of, salt, of sea salt and a quarter teaspoon of baking soda in that solution, you just made an outstanding eyewash. If it's green tea, it will be astringent. You can also put it up your nose, nicely astringent for people with allergies. Green tea is a really nice astringent. Black tea? A little bit more of an astringent, you know? The tannins are a little bit more tannin. You know what that means? You know what tannins are? Tannins are concentrated polyphenols. You know what polyphenols are? They're the pigments that give the plants their colors. So when you unwind a tannin, what color do you get? Kind of black to brown. I guess that's brown to black. Because it's just all the pigments together. That's what a tannin is. They're really astringent. So you could do some black tea up your nose. Do it as a nasal wash. I've had patients with polyps. Two and a half months of doing a nasal wash with black tea. Lipton iced tea black tea. <laughs> We're not even talking about anything fancy. <laughs> and it works great. And it works as an eye wash. If you've got a sty, you put a black tea bag on there or make yourself an eye wash of black tea. It doesn't get simpler than that. Many years ago, I proposed, because we do this in our clinic, that, hey, you know what? You make a decent Daytura tincture, um, put a little salt and some baking soda in it, um, and run it through a nebulizer, it'll stop your asthma attack pretty fast. It does, and you know what? Albuterol gives you a fast heart rate afterwards. Daytura makes you just kind of want to take a nap. Uh, most of my patients would rather be in that position. Most of them don't really like the fast heart rate. You've got better options. You have better tools for these people. And your armamentarium is the entire natural world around you. So my frustration is the rampant cases of imposter syndrome that people have in herbal medicine, in the plant healer world. Well, I've got to get my... AHG certification, really? Because there's not an accredited program here in the United States. There is in England, there is in Germany, there is in Switzerland, there is in France. Um, in fact, all the European nations all offer an accredited um, national exam type of certification. If you want that, not a requirement. In the United States, you know what it gives you? 
You get to go commune with some people, network with some people. Oh, but holy cow, you guys. They're using products off the health food store shelves and out of the Walmart. I'm not getting down on health food stores. I'm just talking about the big ones, right? Um, the little small ones, they usually have a little bit more involved in, uh, in taking care of their, their inventory uh, and better quality product. But there's a lot of herbalists in this world that, you know, because it, it's expensive, it's whatever. Um, there's a lot of people who are armchair herbalists. They don't actually do anything with plants other than make recommendations to people. If you're talking to somebody and they got all the answers, oh yeah, you do this with this, oh yeah, you do that, oh yeah, you do this, you do, oh yeah. They are liars. <laughs> and they don't know Jack. Because the first thing you learn in the real world is there's no right answers. There's the person in front of you and there's the way that you might help them get from point A to point B. And if you can design an effective plan for that, they already believe you can do that for them because they already see you as a liminal member of their community and somebody who's trained in a medical system that they may or may not understand, but it's not what they've been exposed to before. Mm. That brand new thing is exciting to people. It's also scary for people. They gotta be scared a little bit or they're not motivated to do all the things that they might need to do. And of course, you as a practitioner have to know what their limitation is. You know, if you're giving the 78 year old lady 35 things to do in a day, she's not doing them. You give her two things, three things. Most people, most people can handle three things. But you gotta be aware of those who can handle two and those who can handle four, but that's what you do, right? That's what experience helps you develop. So, my plant healer family, you are gifted liminal magic beings. And every one of you has been called to do a thing that's unique in this world. And no one outside of you can know what that even is. But as you do it, you'll know it's right because it feels right. And then things start coming your way in ways that you couldn't even have imagined because you're walking in your own power. And that's inherent to you or you wouldn't be here. It's like these pieces of land that are places. They're inherently powerful. Why? We don't know. We don't know why the dog the drug is club there. We got a story about it. It's an interesting story. You should read it. All we know is it's got this mojo. You have that mojo or you wouldn't be here. With that, I thank you for your kind attention.